Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, everybody. Let me welcome you to another session of Bible study. Let me just say that the Lord is an extremely good God. And, you know, he has kept us, brought us together here online so that we can have another session of Bible study. As usual, <clears throat> we just want to greet you all in the name of Jesus Christ. You are tuning in locally. Um, overseas, wherever you're tuning in from, we want to greet you in the name of Jesus Christ. Let us just bow our head as we pray. Father, we want to bless your name. We honor you. We magnify you. You alone are worthy of praise and worthy to be praised. We thank you, God, for this opportunity, God, where we can share in another session of Bible study. We ask that you be with us. We ask, God, that you will edify your people. We ask, God, that you will strengthen us, that you will strengthen us in the inner man. We pray, Jesus, that, you know, you will just use the words that are spoken to help us as individuals to be better Christians. And we thank you, God, for your love and your mercies. Blessed as we proceed, do this, we ask, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Again, let me just take time out to welcome each and every one of us as we continue our bible study we have been looking at the seven dispensation and we were on the second dispensation which is called the dispensation of conscience amen and we started it but we were not, we were not through so as we go through the different dispensation um we set a format of how we are going to do it. If we did not do this, then you, we would spend a very long time trying to present on each of the dispensation. But what we have done, we have set a guide as to how we are going to look at the dispensation so that we can get to cover it in you know, a, a good period of time. So let us go to our slides as we continue tonight so just looking at what we looking at what we said at part said that we are going to look at the dispensation how we will proceed to looking at the dispensation we said we will look at the beginning of the this of the dispensation who were involved and then point two the command that was given or what was expected of mankind and as we have discussed in this dispensation of innocence there was an expectation from mankind. And then when we look at point three, the failure to obey God's command, and we are going to see this flowing through each of the dispensations that we look at. You know, this, there is always a failure on the part of man to do what the Lord command him to do. Then we are going to look at the judgment that was handed out. And uh, because then the mode of deliverance or the, the, the salvation that was wrought, and we're going to look at one or two takeaway from each dispensation. And that is important because while we will go through the other points and we will present some facts, when we go to the takeaway, we are going to find that, you know, there's a lot that we can learn from the takeaways. And so we're going to focus much on the takeaways. And then now, point seven, what is it that we can learn about the Lord? It would not make sense we go through the dispensation and not find what it is that we can learn about the lord now i must say this that god is immutable he changes not and as we go through we are going to recognize that even though we did not point out a certain things about god in the first dispensation or the second dispensation when we point it out in the third dispensation it does not mean that in the third dispensation, that is the time God get this character. That is the time he operates according to the standard. It is just that it was there from the first dispensation, but we choose to point it out in certain dispensation. Amen. So we said that the dispensation of conscience are the, it's called, <clears throat> sorry, the, Antediluvian dispensation and the antediluvian there mean that it was before the flood. It lasted about 1,656 years. 
from the time of Adam and Eve eviction from the garden until the flood, right? The expulsion of man in the garden from that time when they leave out of the garden and they know started the journey that God put them on, the, the dispensation of innocent clothes and it opens up the, the dispensation of conscience. I want us to know that Adam and Eve lived in both dispensation of innocence, right? And conscience, right? And we are going to see that a lot of these dispensations, there are people who will, you know, end up in another dispensation. Amen. The dispensation demonstrates what mankind will do if left to his own will and conscience. And, uh, you know, as we go down, we will see how oh, wicked man became. And, you know, the Lord had to say it repented him that he made mankind. So when we look at the steward of the dispensation, the stewards were Cain and his family, Abel, Seth and his family, Enoch, Noah, and his family. Now let us look at the command that was given. The dispensation began, like we said, when Adam and Eve was driven out of the garden, right? After man sin, his spirit died. And God chose now to commune with man or to talk with man through his conscience. He chose to direct the part of man by communicating with his conscience, right? And so what happened even in today's days, right? God chose to talk to us through our conscience. When we receive the Holy Ghost, it is the Holy Ghost that prompts us from the inside and he talks to us through our conscience. So God had a new plan which involved, you know, man behavior. If thou doest well, the Bible says, thou shall be accepted. And that is found in Genesis 4, verses 7. So God chose to speak with man through the inner voice called the conscience. And this dispensation, as God chose to speak with man this way, it forms. Uh, a starting point in which God continues to speak with man through the inner voice, through the conscience. Amen. So the command that was given is that the faculty by which we know right from wrong. So the conscience is, sorry, the, the conscience is the faculty by which we know right from wrong. So we were born with this and you know as we grew up there as, and as we grew up and we are cultured a certain way there are certain things that we consider that is wrong and there are some things that we know it is in it and we we can know that this thing is wrong and our conscience will tell us that you know this thing is wrong you should not do it so the conscience began to function when adam and eve sinned if thou doest well shall though not be accepted. So God knew plan for man involved his behavior, right? And God expect man now through his conscience to live a certain way. And, you know, it was expected that man could live and should choose the things that are right. All that was required of Adam and his descendants in this dispensation was to one, approach God by means of a blood sacrifice. The Bible in Genesis 4, verses 4, and Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. Right? So all that was expected of mankind at this time was that they should approach God by means of a blood sacrifice. I don't know, the scripture did not mention how often it is that they should do this blood sacrifice, how often it is that they should come before God, but it was a requirement that they came before God with 
a blood sacrifice. Then now, be what it is that they should do. Live for God by following the leading of the conscience. Again, if thou doest well, shall thou not be accepted. So, it was expected of man that he was now in living for God because he had, he had sin. The, the conscience will now be a guide. And God will now talk to him through his conscience. And if he choose to do well, he will be accepted. However, we see where man refused to be guided by the voice of God through his conscience and choose to do his own will. Amen. Now we go to point G. My, um, the failure of, of man to obey God's commandment. Um, in the process of time, it came to pass that Adam knew Eve, we know the scripture, and, and she begat Cain and Abel. Cain was a tiller of the ground, and Abel was a keeper of the sheep. And Adam knew his wife, and she conceived, and she bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man-child of the Lord. And she again bared another son and called him Abel. And Abel was the keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. So, man was expected to live by God, please God, offer a blood sacrifice, and he was expected to serve God by God, now guiding him through his conscience, right? But when we look now in the book of Genesis chapter 6, we see where the wickedness of man would further increase. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness was on the earth and it repented God that he made man. Mankind violated his conscience and failed in his responsibility to do the right thing. So both sons, both sons were well acquainted with what was required of them. Yet, we saw where one son offered what God required and the next son offered what he felt he should have had offered. So in the process of time, let us look at Genesis chapter 4. Verse 3 to 5. So in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstling of his flock and of the flock thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had no respect. And Cain was very wrath, and his countenance fell. So there were two altars, like I said, that were erected. One piled high with the fruit and the grain of the ground, and the other laden with fleshly slain, freshly slain animal. Evidently, Abel's sacrifice was consumed by the fire from heaven as a sign of God's acceptance. But Cain's offering would remain untouched. God didn't look at it. What made the difference? Abel's offering indicates love and obedience to the redemptive plan requiring a blood sacrifice because his Sacrificial gifts were according to the divine instructions God wanted. The Bible in Hebrews says, by faith in Hebrews 11 verse 4, by faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gift, and by it being dead yet speaketh. 
Amen. They can go back to the slides. Let's go to the next slide. So God wanted man now to discover that he could not live by his own conscience or the conscience could not be the only guide because if he allows his conscience to be the only guide, then he will always tend to do wrong. So when we look in the passage, we recognize that, you know, Cain offered certain things that he wanted to offer and able to offer that which was required. When we look now in Genesis chapter 6, we recognize that the man became, the society became extremely wicked. And it was now seen by man, so to speak, that he could not allow his conscience to be the only guy, the only thing that will cause him to, to live for God. Out of all that live in this dispensation, only Abel, Enoch, and Noah were called the righteous. And the scriptures for that, you can find them in Hebrews 11, verse 4, 5, 6, and 7. So I want us to understand that many folks live in this dispensation because at this time, the, the, the mankind begin to, to spread and they populate. And what happens is that out of this dispensation, only three names the Bible mentioned that were called righteous. And those were Abel, Enoch, and Noah. I want us to understand in a virgin that Though there are many, there are only few that really desire God. There are, only, there are only few that really want to be called the sons and the children of God. And only three names were mentioned in this dispensation that were called, amen, the, 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 the righteous in this dispensation. All right, now let us look at the judgment, the judgment that was handing out, right? So when we stop in Genesis chapter 6, we recognize that the, 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 the mankind became desperately wicked. The heart of man became desperately wicked and God was about to judge mankind. Anytime you say mankind start behaving such a, in, in some kind of way, God will bring judgment. But before we look at the judgment that, you know, took the world at that time, we want to just look a little bit at the, at, at the judgment that was handed out and came during the dispensation of conscience, right? I want us to understand that God was long-suffering um, uh, uh, and he gave Cain time to repent right but Cain did not repent and, and and God allowed him a certain time and then after a certain time had elapsed that was the time God stepped in I want us to understand that God will not necessarily act on the first thing that you do he will not necessarily act on the second thing that you do but I want us to know that God is is taking note of what it is that we are doing and when a certain time come or when he feel like it is time for him to step in god is going to step in and he's going to reward us according to the work that we do right so he gave cain time to repent but cain was disrespectful cain was disrespectful Full, and yet God gave him space to repent. And this is one of the things that we, 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 we love about God. You know? God is long-suffering and he always gives space to repent because when God acts, brethren, only God alone can, will turn back around and say, look here, him really, because when we look at the, the dispensation of conscience. After all the earth was flooded out, God said, look here, boy, you feel how we or all the human beings were killed, except for no one's family. And he said, I will not destroy the earth again with water. 
I want us to understand, Virgin, that God is long-suffering. But when God get ready to act, he will act. Let us find Genesis chapter 3, chapter 4, sorry, 3 to 5 and 7. So we're looking now at the judgment of Cain, right? And so God allowed Cain to stop. He allowed Cain to talk. He allowed Cain to bring something on the, act, on, the, on the altar. And God did not act, right? Cain was disrespectful. Cain was disobedient. Cain knew what was required by God. But yet he refused to offer to God what God required. So God did not act. But look here in, 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 in Genesis chapter 4. And in the process of time, that Cain brought the fruit of the ground and offering. And Abel also brought of the firstling of the flock and the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But to Cain and his offering, he had no respect. And Cain was vexed. Cain was wrought. He was not wrought with his brother. You know, He was jealous of his brother. But he was vexed that God did not accept what he offered him. And the Bible said his countenance fell. So Cain's offering was not accepted by God. And this caused Cain to be very angry with the Lord. He was jealous of his brother Abel. And God warned Cain, but Cain refused the counsel of the Lord. The Lord said unto him, let us go to verse 7. If thou doest well, shall thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. I want us to understand, Virgin, that God acknowledges God acknowledges the reality of human nature. We, were, we are locked in a bottle with sin's desire for us. Right? Paul said, for the good that I would. Jesus, for the good that I would. So Paul knew the battle that was fought in this flesh. And so the Lord said to Cain, because the Lord understand it, understood it, you know. And the Lord said, if thou doest well, shall it not be accepted? And he said, unto thee will be thy desire, and thou shalt rule over him. So God was saying, you know, that sin desire to take you over. But he, must, he was saying, now, Cain, you have control. You mustn't. Allow sin to take you over. You must rule over it. God told Cain that he is responsible to win the battle and not allow sin to rule over him. Sometimes it's difficult. Let us go to Romans 7, 19. Sometimes it's difficult, you know. For the good. So this was the Apostle Paul now, you know, talking about the struggle that we have in the flesh, right? He said, for the good that I would, I do not. This was a man that knew God, you know, was caught up in the third, third heavens. And he said, for the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that do I. So there is a battle, Virgin, that we all have to fight. And Cain was... At the point of fighting this battle. And God is saying that you have the power to be victorious. Don't allow sin to rule over you. So I want us to understand that today we are locked, locked in a battle with sin's desire for us. But we are responsible, brethren, to win the battle. Just as our Cain was locked in a battle and sin got the better of Cain, we are we today are locked 
in a battle. And we cannot allow sin to get the better of us. We have got to have this mindset, Virgin, that we are going to live for God. I am not saying that we can't make mistakes, you know. Be yes, if any man sin, he have an advocate with the Father. And we have to go back to the Father and say, boy, God, forgive me. We have to die daily. But God give us the ability to choose. And we have to exercise that ability to choose to serve God. So Cain was jealous. Let us go to the next slide. Cain was jealous of his brother. He was angry at the Lord. And Cain did the unthinkable. And this is a long read. Genesis 4, 18 to 16. So Cain did the unthinkable. So look, his brother did what he was supposed to do. His brother did what he was supposed to do. But Cain refused to do what was required of him. And he was angry. He was jealous. He allowed jealousy to get the better of him. And jealousy lead to murder. Let us go to the, the passage. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother. Some other translation, you know, said that it was Cain that called his brother to the field. So, and Cain talked with Abel, his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother. And slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is thy, where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood cried unto me from the ground. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which had opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth heal unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shall thou be in the earth. And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out from the face of the earth, and from the face, from thy face shall I be hid, and I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth, and it shall come to pass that everyone that findeth me shall slay me. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any man finding him should kill him. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. Let's go back to the slide. So, Cain killing Abel was a profound transgression. This was the first murder that was recorded in the Bible. Although God's subsequent judgment in the passage that we read might seem lenient, I want us to understand that its weight was severe. I particularly Point, want to point out this judgment that was passed down on Cain so that we, the people of God today, might understand that God will still judge us as individuals. And when we get to the judgment that was passed down on the entire world, we are going to recognize that God will again judge the world. But I want us to understand, Virgin, that God will judge us as individuals. And when we look at this judgment that was passed on and Cain, it was not light. It was very severe. One, he said, Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth. So what God did you know, in cursing Cain, remember now, Cain, God allowed him, right? God allowed him to 
to do all what he wanted to do. We allowed him to, to carry fruit from the ground or, or grown provision and put on the altar, which God did not require. God allowed him to do that. God allowed him to be disobedient. God leave him. But when he now committed murder and killed his brother, that was the time God chose to act. And the first thing that, remember, you know, the Bible tells us that he was a tiller of the ground. That was his profession. And the first thing that God did, oh, glory to God, the first thing that God did was that God shut off the ground, Jesus, from healing when he planted and some folks, because they are entering into the way of Cain, and, and they might find things are tough with them and rough with them. And even the things that they know, this is the trade, is not healing anything. It is because they've gone in the way of Cain in a disobedient way. They've gone in a way of bridging that. It, 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 they stand against God and they disrespect God and, and, and not care what you do. The, the life can't be any better. And God shut off the ground from Cain. So when Cain, as a tiller, plant, no provision. Then Cain is Cain said, Cain said this, you know, he said, from thy face shall I be hid. So, in other words, Cain was living on the earth, but he had no communication, no lot and part with God. It was a sentence to eternal damnation, even though he was alive and on earth. Oh, glory to God. This is how God deal with people that is rebellious. And I want us to take note of that. This is how God deal with people who are disobedient and rebellious. Them up. He said, I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth. But here is what Cain was worried about. Cain was worried about another folk seeing him and killing him. He had no remorse. So even when he, the earth was not going to heal for him, when he was cut off from the presence of God, he was all right with that. When he was going to move from place to, and be a vagabond, he was all right with that only concern Cain had oh Jesus was about someone killing him but look what God did tell you that the punishment was great you know this is how God deals with rebellious people this is how God deals with persons who know the right thing to do but choose to do the wrong hallelujah I want us bridging to understand and this is why I'm spending the time to point it out to us that God still, God is a God that will deal with us as individuals. The Bible says, for every man must work out his own salvation with what? Fear and trembling. So God is an individualistic God, but he also deals with us as a people. So Cain was worried about somebody killing him, but, but the Lord the one who put a mark. The Bible did not say what kind of mark God put on him, you know, but God put a mark on him. So even if he wanted to beg somebody to take him out of misery, nobody would, was willing to help him in that way because vengeance will be taken on that person sevenfold. So the ground was not healing. The, the, the cure what I'm plant, the cure what I'm plant, it will not heal. 
he could not see the face of the Lord again. He cannot come in the presence of God. He cut off from the presence of God. And he was a wanderer, a vagabond, a fugitive. And on top of that, God put a mark on him and said, nobody can kill him. He had to live out his life in misery. This punishment stripped him and forced him into a life of wandering. He was now living a life in which he had no hope. No hope for repentance. For Cain, the punishment which stripped him of his livelihood as a tiller of the ground and forced him into a life of wandering felt more burdensome than death itself. And that is why God said, nobody put a mark on him. Nobody will take his life. He must have to live it out. So God will allow us, virgin, to act up. God will allow us to be disobedient. God will allow us to have our own way. But when God gets ready, God is going to judge us as individuals. And this is what happened to Cain. Cain was judged for his sin. All right, let us go to the, the next slide. So then now we go back to Genesis chapter 6. Let us find, find Genesis chapter 6. So we said that we, we, we point out to us that God judged Cain as an individual and we we made the point that god will judge us god will deal with us as individuals but then when we jump over to chapter six down because we're looking at the judgment you know we saw where the world became very evil at that time during the dispensation of conscience verse five and god saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that Every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it what repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth. And it grieved him at his heart. So when God saw the wickedness of man, it grieved him. And, he, and it, it, I believe that he was saying that, boy, I shouldn't have made man any at all. Next verse. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing and the folds of the year, for it repented me that I have made them. So we made the point that the world became very evil at that time during the dispensation of contents. The Bible said Cain and his wife found a civilization in a city called Enoch, named after Cain's first son. There were probably several hundred descendants by this time, right? And when we met the last time, we, we mentioned about one of Cain's grandson, Tubal Cain, and how wicked he was. So we had no doubt that the wickedness that spread on the earth that, at that time came from the descendants of Cain. And the corruption that at that time overwhelmed the earth. And we recognize now that it repented God that he made man. God was ready to move. He was ready to act. Just the declaration to destroy man from the face of the earth. It repented God that he made man, right? God uh, praised the wickedness. He said every imagination of the thought of man, heart, was only evil continually. Thus, he said, I am going to destroy man from the face of the earth. Bible said that it repented the Lord that he made man. God was about to make a move. The stench of sin got into his nostril. 
and he was set to destroy mankind from the face of the earth. But I want us to understand, brethren, that God will not destroy the righteous with the wicked. The Bible says that Noah, Genesis 6, 8 to, 20, 6, 8 to 22, says that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. I want us to understand, Virgin, that in a similar sense, like Noah, we are living in a time right now where the stench of sin has gone up to the nostril of God. When we look at murder, remember now, you know, God acted when Cain murdered Abel. But when we look around us now, murder is at an all-time high. The blood of the innocent brethren is crying unto the Lord from the ground. Reveling is at an all-time high. Same sex and everything that surrounds it is at an all-time high. I want us to bridge it to understand that we are living in a time where you can be a man. You were born a male. But you can just decide, Bridget, that tomorrow you're a female and the world will recognize you as a female. Right now, they are putting in things in place. And if a, a female said that she feel like a male and tomorrow she is a male, they will look at that. Bridget, we are living in a time where everything that surrounds same sex is at an all-time high. Wickedness and ungodliness is at an all-time high. I believe that God is about to act. I believe that a judgment is coming. However, I want us to understand that the Lord will not destroy the righteous with the wicked. The church will be taken out and then the judgment will roll out. Any doctrine that tell you that the church is going to go through the tribulation that is a lie from the pit of hell the, i want us to understand that there's a principle in scripture god will not destroy will not judge the righteous with the wicked when he was about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, he took out righteous lot and his family both of Sodom and then he destroyed it. I want us to understand when he was about to destroy this world during the time of conscience, he delivered Noah and his family. So there's a precedent that is set, Virgin. Anytime God is ready to act, he will not destroy the righteous with the wicked. And the Bible says, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. God now began to execute his plan to deliver Noah and his household from the pending judgment. Let us find that Genesis 6. These are the generation of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generation. And Noah walked with God. And Noah begot three sons, three sons Shem, Ham, and Japhet. Japhet. And the earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupt his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me. For the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shall thou make in the ark, and shall pitch it within and without with pitch. And this is the fashion which thou shalt make it. The length of the ark shall be 
300 cubics, the breadth of it 50 cubics, and the height of it 30 cubics. And, win, and a window shall thou make, and in cubic shall thou finish it above. And the door of the ark shall thou set in the side thereof, with a lower second and third stories shall thou make it. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh wherein is the breath of life from under the heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. But with thee will I establish my covenant, O glory to God, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy, thy wife and thy son's wife with thee. And of every living thing of all the flesh, two of every sort, shall thou bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee. They shall be male and female. Of the folds after their kind, and of the cattle after their kind, of every creeping thing of the earth after his kind, two of every sort shall thou come unto thee to keep them alive. And take thou unto thee of all food that is eaten, and thou shalt gather it to thee, and it shall be for food for thee and for them. Thus, I like this, 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 this passage, you know, thus did Noah according to all, oh Jesus, that God commanded him, so did he. So like I've been saying, God will not destroy the righteous with the wicked. So God warned Noah of the impending flood and instructed him to build and ark. Noah won his contemporaries for a number of years as he built the ark. He won his, comp his contemporaries. He won the folks that were alive and saw him building the ark at that time. They mocked him, they jeered him, but he continued to build because he had a word from God. He, God instructed him what he should do. During this time that Noah was building the ark, the Lord was extremely patient with the people. Just like how he was patient with Cain, he allowed Cain to act out to do that. And he was extremely patient with Cain. He gave Cain time to repent, but Cain did not repent. During this time that Noah was building the ark, God was extremely patient with the people. However, the people refused to repent. Even in this day and age, the Lord is extremely patient with mankind. Look at all the things that, you know, we mentioned that are happening around us. Uh, 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 everything points that God is about to act. But I believe that God, just as we left the ark door open, that if somebody would come, I believe that right now we are in a time where the ark door is open. And just for somebody to hear and to change their life. During that time, God was extremely patient, but the people refused to repent. And, and like I said, Noah did according to all that the Lord commanded him. Noah deviated not to the left. He deviated not to the right. He did all that the Lord commanded him. Next slide. I want us to understand, Virgin, that God is the righteous judge. And being the righteous judge, he must deal with sin. And this is how it, it is how it is. We are going to find that in each dispensation when God deals with sin. You disobey God, God is going to deal with you. Right? So, because he's righteous, he's a righteous judge, he deals with sin. When he deals with sin, 
the lot of the wicked will not rest upon the righteous. Let us find 2 Peter 2, 4 to 9. His judgment then and his grace within that judgment has informed us today of this fact that God will not rest the lot of the wicked upon the righteous. For if God spear not the angels that sin, but cast them down to hell and deliver them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spear not the world, but save Noah, the eight persons, creature of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. And turn the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. And deliver just lot, vexed with filthy conversation of the wicked. For that right for that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vex his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. So he speared not the angels. We can go back to the slide. We spear not the angels. Right, that sin and left their first estate is peered at the world during the time of Noah, is peered not Sodom and Gomorrah. Why would somebody in this day of an age, right, think that God will spear the ungodly? There are folks right now who are teaching that God will not destroy the ungodly. He will not judge them, but that he will give them another chance to, to see if they can live right. I want us to understand that if God fear not, like I said, you know, God is long suffering. He will give us peace to repent, but if we refuse to repent, he is going to act. And when he is hacked, he is going to act. He will not give us another chance to say, all right, live again and, and, and try and live good this time. But he is going to judge us for the deeds that we do. So why would somebody think that in this time, in this day and age, God will spear the ungodly? I want us to know, Virgin, that this is a lie from the pit of hell. And it is set up to deceive individuals, the, to, to have them to think that, look here, they can live any and any way. And even if they're dead, God will raise them up again and give them a chance, oh Jesus, to live right. Nothing like that. That is not in the Bible. Right? The way of the ungodly. Let us find this passage in Psalm. I want us to understand that God knows the way of the ungodly, that the way of the ungodly shall perish. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drive it away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. So like I said, God will not destroy the righteous with the wicked. The lot of the unrighteous shall not rest upon the wicked. So this is what Psalm, the psalmist is saying. You know, he said, nor sinners, he said, therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. So anybody is telling you, you're listening to my voice, and anybody tell you that, look here, even if you're dead, God go and raise you up, and you shall live again, right? He's going to raise you up to judge you if you die in your sins. So when the ark was completed, no, the Lord instructed Noah and his family to enter. I want us to understand, Virgin, that Noah and his family entered. 
the clean beast entered. The unclean beast entered. But majority of mankind refused to enter. The animals knew that they were supposed to enter. But mankind, who is so much in, more intelligent than the animal, refused to enter. So the Bible said that the flood came and all living things on the face of the earth were destroyed except for Noah and his family. All human on, that, on the earth at, the, at that time were destroyed. Only eight souls were saved. So, like I said, Bridget, God will judge us as individuals. The, the judgment, the punishment that Cain was handed out to Cain was severe. Cain wanted to die, but God put a mark on him and said, nobody can kill him. So he will judge us as an individual if we behave and continue to behave a particular way. But I want us to understand that as a people, as people living on the earth, God is going to come, he's going to come again, and he's going to judge the entire world. Where do you stand? Are you in church, but out of church? Do you have one foot in the straight and narrow, and one foot on the road that leadeth to destruction? Listen, Bridget, we can't serve two masters. God is going to come again and he's going to judge this entire world. Amen. Now let us look at the mode of deliverance. So we read through the passage a while ago. We recognize that God instructed Noah what he should do, how he should build the ark. He gave him all the instructions, right? So we said in, in, in our previous discussion that with every dispensation, there is a mode of deliverance or there is a mode of salvation. And, and since God is a just God and since God um, is a holy God, is a righteous God, and he, he, he treats all his creation very well. I want us to know, Bridget, that we said it, he will not destroy the righteous with the wicked. And so what he did now to preserve Noah and his family was to give him a vehicle that will save him and his household. Right? So the Bible said that God extended grace to Noah and his family. Right? And God instructed him to build a heart. I want us to understand, Virgin, that for each dispensation that we will look at, that salvation is only through the grace of God. Salvation can only be through the grace of Almighty God. And the Bible said that Noah found grace and God gave him the instruction to build the ark. To the righteous Noah, God announced his plan. The entire world would be destroyed by a flood. Only Noah and his family would escape the catastrophe and, the, and then re-establish the human race. But because God only intended to kill the, 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 and judge those who are wicked, right, and, 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 the, and preserve the land animals, he built this thing that would deliver Noah and deliver the animals that went in. Let us go to the next slide. So the exact blueprint, all the necessary details for the escape vehicle was given to Noah, the length thereof, the width thereof, the height thereof, the type of wood that should be used. God was specific Gave him the details. Put a window there. Put a door there. Put three levels. God gave him everything. So Noah could not build the ark. He wanted to build the ark. 
or how we think they should build the ark. God gave the blueprint. You know, some folks want to dictate the mode of deliverance, you know. They want to tell you that, you know, why this is all, this is all I want to serve God. This is how I believe that, you know, salvation should be. Why me have to get baptized? Why you have to receive the Holy Ghost? They want to dictate how salvation should be. But I, I, I want somebody to understand. For by grace, the Bible says, I receive through faith and that not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So if we even think that the salvation should be this way, God is saying that this is how I want it. Repentance, water baptism, infilling of the Holy Ghost, living a holy life. If you think that salvation should be some different or be different, fine with you. But it is not God that stands in need of salvation. It is us, the songwriter said, it is me. It's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. So it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of salvation. God did not have to send his son. But because he's not a wicked God, sent his son. That you might have life. That I might have life. More about that day. So now I build the ark. Build the ark. According to all that the Lord commanded him. And God used this vehicle. To save. Eight souls. Use this vehicle to save eight souls. And the dispensation end here. But let us now look at point six. Yes, we're looking at the takeaways now, right? The takeaway from the dispensation. So there are two takeaways that we have here. The first one, Cain wanted to serve God on his own terms. And then the second one, Cain did not show brotherly love, right? So similarly to how Abel knew, that we deal with the first point. Similarly to all, Abel knew what was required. Cain also knew what was required of him. How did Abel knew what was required of him by God? Remember we said in the first dispensation when Adam and Eve sinned, God slew an animal. So from that experience, Adam would have known what was required by God. And so Adam, I believe, would have taught Cain and Abel, oh, bless the name of Jesus Christ, would have taught Cain and, and Abel what it is that they are supposed to do. This is what God required. God required the fat, and God required this to be on the altar. And when you see the fire come down, you know that God accepted. So the same way how Abel knew what was required of God was the same way Cain knew what was required of him. But guess what? Cain was just a rebellious child. Cain refused to do. I am not sure if it was bad parenting. I'm not sure if it was something that the parents did that caused Cain to act out this way. But from what we can deduce from the passage, Adam and Eve did their best. Because Abel knew what was required and he did what was required of him. So there was no doubt that Adam taught his sons what was required of him. Next slide. So Cain and Abel came before God and we read the scripture, right? They came before God to offer their sacrifice. Genesis chapter 4, 3 to 5. And they came to offer what was due at the time. Cain brought the fruit of the ground. 
and offered the fruit of the ground unto the Lord. And Abel, we said, brought the firstling of the flocks and the fat thereof. And the Lord accepted Abel's offering. So Cain and Abel came before God and offered their sacrifice. Cain offered from the ground that offered things from the ground that was first. Remember when, when God cursed Adam, the first thing that God did was to curse be the ground from which. So what Cain did was, was knowing or was to offer something from the ground to God that was cursed. And Abel offered unto God a blood sacrifice, which is what God required, life for life, because the, the, the life is in the blood, and God required the life from the animal, right, and the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel's offering. In other words, God accepted Abel's offering, but he rejected the offering of Cain. Cain was angry. Because his offering was rejected. Oh, glory to God. He was angry with God because God rejected his offering. Let us go to Genesis chapter 4, 3 to 7. Sorry, 6 and 7. So because Cain's offering was rejected, he was angry with the Lord. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why are thou wrought? And why is thy countenance fallen? So he was sad and he was angry. If thou doest well, shall thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lies at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. So the Lord gave Cain space to repent. He gave Cain space to do the right thing. The Lord warned Cain. Say, sin lieth at the door. But you cannot let sin rule over you. You rule over sin. If you do the right thing, will it not be accepted? However, Cain wanted to do his own thing. He wanted to go against the Lord. Next slide. Yeah. So Cain wanted to go against the Lord by doing his own thing. Bridget. Cain wanted to go against the Lord by doing his own thing. Cain wanted to go against the Lord by doing his own thing. He wanted to serve God on his own terms. God, I know what it is that you require. I know that you require a blood sacrifice, but I want to give you the fruit that comes from the ground. I want to give you the produce that comes from the ground. And Cain knew that he was dealing with God. He wanted to give God what he chose to give and not what God required. God, I know what you require. I know what you require, God. But this is what I'm going to give you. If you want to accept it, you accept it. If not, your business. So he was intent and driven to do his own thing. When he knew what was required. Cain was intent and driven, bless the name of Jesus Christ, to do his own thing when he knew what was required. In other words, Cain was rebellious. And what did the Bible say about rebellion? Let us go to 1 Samuel 15, 23. 
for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. So this was was was, was the, the prophet Samuel in a talking to King Saul because God had told King Saul what, what he should have done. And time after time, King Saul refused to do what the Lord commanded him to do. And the prophet came to him and said, For rebellion is as witchcraft. What is rebellion? Let's go back to the slide. What is rebellion, brethren? Rebellion, brethren. Rebellion, brethren, is knowing what God requires and knowing what is required of you and you refuse to do it. So, if you're in a workplace and the workplace has rules, Jesus, and the workplace has rules and you refuse to do what the workplace stipulates, you are being rebellious. And the Bible says, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. So if you know what God requires, you know the right thing to do, and you don't do it, you tell yourself, say, you're not going to do it. That is rebellion. That is you as an individual being rebellious. And I want you to understand, look, I point out earlier on to us, you know, how God deal with Cain. God allow him to act out, and it might look like God is not doing anything, and God allow Cain to act out, act out. And when Cain commit murder, God said, yes, I'm ready to deal with you now. And when God dealt with him, Cain said, look here, it's too hard. But God will hand out the judgment that meet our behavior. God will give the punishment that fit the crime. So he was rebellious, and rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. I want us to understand, Virgin, that the spirit of Cain, next slide, the spirit of Cain is still alive today. The spirit of Cain is still alive today. You will talk to somebody that is unsaved. You will tell them about the gospel. You will tell them that, look here, this is what God requires. God requires holiness. And folks will tell you, that, look here, they cannot deal with serving God. Because that is what God requires. And they know that it is the word of God. And they know that this is what God requires. And they refuse to serve God. And that is why God is going to punish people, you know. Because when you hear the word, the Bible says, how will they hear unless a preacher preach? And when the preacher preach and they hear, they refuse it. And they know that it is the word of God. God the Spirit convict them, you know. And they know that it is the word of God. And they refuse to surrender. And B, there are folks. There are folks, brethren. That are safe. Repent, baptize, fill with the Holy Ghost. And they know what God requires. And yet they refuse to do what God requires. They refuse to do the right thing. They want to offer God. These are people who are supposed to be saved, you know. They want to offer God what they think God deserves instead of giving God what he truly deserves. They want to give God a part. But God is saying, look here, I don't need a part. I need everything.
we have folks who knew, know, know the right thing, know what to do, know what is required of them. And, oh, bless the name of God, they refuse to do it. Regine, let us be careful. Let us not be rebellious. If you know the right thing to do, and you refuse to do it, you are being rebellious. And God will judge. So I want us to understand, Virgin, that even if I weigh my mind hard, still weighing it hard. Like I said earlier on, you go to a workplace and they have rules there. If you refuse to abide by the rule, you are being rebellious on what they do. They will fire you for not obeying the rules. So how is it that there is rule set up in the workplace and we go to the workplace and we abide by the rule? But if we say something in a church, don't wear flip-flop, come to church. Don't do this, come to church. People are offended. But they will go to the workplace and they will subject themselves. If the workplace says wear a uniform, they wear a uniform. Even if the uniform don't look good. But when it comes to church, Anything goes. And if you allow certain things to happen before you know it, church becomes a strip club. Hallelujah. Church becomes a strip club legend. I want us to understand. If you know what is required and you refuse to do what is required, to you, you are being disobedient and rebellious. And rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. thing might not be written in scriptures. The thing might not be written in scriptures, but how oh, many of us have convictions of the Holy Ghost that is not written in scripture? Or is it that we don't get conviction from the Holy Ghost? Glory to God. I want us, uh, Bridget, I'm here to save life. I'm here to save individuals. If we know the right thing to do and we're not doing the right thing, we are being rebellious. And I perceive folks are not aware of the harm they are doing to themselves. That stripped Cain of his livelihood because he was rebellious. And God will do the same thing today. You know what to do when you're not doing it. God will strip you. And so some folks are in church, you know, but they are rebellious. And, and, and they, they say, boy, God, they, they, they ask you, elder, pray for me. Minister, pray for me. And the situation just cannot change. Instead, it change for the better, it change for the worse. And you're not aware that you're harming yourself by being rebellious. And so when you look around you, you see some other people, some other folks climbing the ladder. And you say, but God may not move in from, you're not moving because you are rebellious. Don't think God is going to take somebody that is rebellious and elevate them. You see how God deals with people that are rebellious in scripture. He punish Cain, he rejects Saul. 
and he is the same God. Oh, glory to God. And God will look at the scripture in Luke. I have it up there. And that servant which knew his Lord's will, which means that you know what to do, and you prepare not yourself. Neither did according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. So you know what to do, you're not doing it. You're going to be flogged with many stripes. The spirit of Cain brethren is still alive. Cain and his generation died centuries ago. But Jesus, the spirit that drove the man is still alive today and is driving people, driving people to the to destruction. And we are, are not seeing that we are doing ourselves harm. That is why the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6. Find that one. Ephesians chapter 6, 1. We're hurting ourselves. We have it rough, but we're not, we don't, we're not sure what is happening. It is because we are rebellious. And, and this is what the Bible says, you know. He said, children, obey your parents in the Lord. For this is what? Right. Next verse. He said, honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with what? Promise. That it might be well so you see, if you don't obey your mother and father, children, it's not going to be well with you, you know. It's a promise this the Bible makes, you know. Obey that it might be well with thee. So when parents start and, and, and you feel like you, you have arrived and, and, and you don't you, 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 you know, want to listen to what the parent says, I want you to know children, young people. It might not be what you like. But if you obey, it will be well with you. But if not, it not going to be well. And the last part of the verse says, and thou mayest live long on the earth. This is the first commandment with promise. The spirit of Cain is still alive. Still alive. It is a rebellious spirit. But we come against that spirit in the name of Jesus. We claim our young people. We claim the souls in the house. People who know what to, is required and not doing it. Just being defiant. And I want you to understand, Virgin, that you are doing yourself harm. You're not doing yourself any good if you are in the house of God and you are rebellious. So Cain, instead of... Cain insisted on setting his own standards for what is acceptable. He had all the opportunity to repent, to offer a good sacrifice, to come with a proper sacrifice. You know, after he saw what pleased God, but he allowed jealousy to close his eyes. And Cain demanded that God be pleased with his own efforts. And he refused to follow the plan of God. And this kind of thing still plagues mankind today. Let us go to the next slide. So we say Cain also did not show brotherly love, which is B, 
So Abel did nothing to Cain. All he did was to offer to God what was required. Can you imagine? You were taught what was required. You knew what was required and you offered to God what was required. But somebody was jealous of that and somebody killed you for that. Kill you for doing the right thing. All he did was to offer to God what that was requested of him. So Cain was jealous. He refused to admit his error and he killed his brother. Genesis 4, 6 to 9. We read it already, right? So he was jealous. He refused to admit his error and he killed his brother. I want us to understand, Virgin, that he, he was jealous because the Lord accepted his brother's offering. Um, and, and instead of repenting, he allowed the jealousy to, to take hold of him, to, to close his eye, and he murdered his brother. I want you to understand that, that let, us, let us find the scripture. I think I'm missing something. Let us find the scripture. Genesis 4, 6 to 9. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wrought, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shall thou not be accepted, and if thou doest not well, sin light at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with, his, with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? Am I my brother's keeper? Every man, virgin, I want us to understand, every man is his brother's keeper. Where is thy brother? Cain's response was, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? Again, he was disrespectful. But I want us to know, Virgin, that every man is his brother's keeper in that we are not to commit violent acts against our brother or we should not allow individuals to commit violent acts against them. We should try and prevent it. This sort of keeping, being our brother's keeper, is something God demands of everyone. On the grounds of both justice and love. But Cain's reply, let us go back to the side. Cain's reply indicates Cain's reply indicates a lack of any kind of feelings for another. So he had no feelings for his brother. No, no not at all. And today there are people who are cool like that. They have no feelings for another human being. He and response indicate the absence of brotherly love. The, the, Two of them grew up, but he did not love him any at all. Three, it indicates a kind of selfishness which, which kills affection and gives rise to hatred. So for no good reason, he hated his brother. And he replied, am I my brother's keeper? The same question Cain asks the Lord is the very same question folks are asking today. Am I my brother's keeper? Then if not, you who? Am I my brother's keeper? Yes, you. You are your brother's keeper. If you hate your brother, the Bible says you are a murderer. So you might not literally kill your brother, you know, like Cain 
Cain literally kill his brother. So you might not literally kill your brother. But if you hate your brother, the Bible says that you're a murderer. If we hate our brother, the Bible says that we are a murderer. If we slander our brother and, and wish bad things for him, we are murderers. First John 3, 15. So whosoever hated his brother is a murderer. And he knew that no murderer had eternal life abiding in him. First John 3, 15. We just read 15, 16 and 17. So the Apostle John now, he talks about the outworking of love, right? And when he talks about the outworking of love, he, he, he now mentions some of the things that we should do if we love. Hereby we perceive the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we are to lay down our lives for our brethren. But whosoever hath this world good and seeth his brother have a need and shoot up his bowels of compassion from him. How dwelleth the love of God in him? So Cain had no love, no feelings, no nothing at all for his brother. And today folks have no, I was talking safe persons, you know. It's all about me, myself, and I. But, but, but hear what John says. John talking about love, and this is how love works. He said, God laid on his life first. And so it is that we are supposed to lay down our life for our brother. What does it mean to be my brother's keeper? Hey, you will not cause them to stumble. So, brethren, I always say like this, you know. You see, if you do certain things, let us find the scripture. If you do certain things that will cause your brother to stumble, because a sister can wear certain things, you know, and, and it cause your brother to gone, you know. A brother can do some certain things that will cause a sister to stumble. So the apostle said, Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother offended. So if we are going to be our brother's keeper, right, we must be conscious that our action might cause our brother or our sister to stumble. And then we have got to adjust accordingly. B, you will try to restore your brother. It means that when you notice your brother doing things that are not godly, you will have enough of a relationship with your brother. That you can have a hard, you can have a good conversation with him, pray for him, and help to guide him back to God. Galatians 6 verse 1. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, he which are spiritual restores such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. So being my brother's keeper means that I should have a relationship with him, that I can talk with him, that I can restore him. See, it means that my brother needs are prayed for and are met. So my brother come and him share him needs with me. I say, boy, yes, I pray for him. After I pray for him, I say, all right, God will provide. When I have something that can help him. Matthew 25, 40. And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of 
the least of these my brethren, he have done it unto me. So the needs must be met. We pray for the needs. And we try to meet the needs physically. Back to the slide. It means emotional and spiritual support is readily given. So, might be an emotional thing that your, your brother is going through. You are dear to support. He needs spiritual strength. Iron sharpness. Iron, you are dear to support. Right? So, being your brother keeper means that emotionally, spiritually, physically, you are dear to support. In any given situation that the individual might be in. It means that you are to love your brother. John 13, 35. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples. If ye love one another. So, brethren, being your brother's keeper means that you have to do this. Mean that you have to get with your brother when time is convenient to know your brother. Means that you have to share things with your brother. Cain did none of this. Cain hate his brother because his brother did the right thing. And God said the innocent blood which the earth took in is crying out unto me. His brother did not deserve it. And finally, point seven. What is it that we can learn about the Lord? Well, when we deal with the first dispensation, we said that the Lord always have a plan. When Adam and Eve sinned, we said that the devil tripped them up. But God had a plan and he ruled out that plan in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. When the first prophecy about Jesus Christ was made. And then no, we also made the point that God is merciful, right? And God being merciful basically means that when we deserve punishment, he does not punish us, but he in fact bless us. So when Adam and Eve sinned, though the, 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 God being, the, the justice of God required that they should be put to death, what God did was instead kill an animal, right? And they experienced God's mercy at that time. So God is merciful. He always have a plan. And we establish that from when we look at the first dispensation, right? So though God is merciful and long-suffering here in this dispensation, we want to point out that God is a just God. What do we mean when we say God is a just God? He is perfectly righteous in his treatment of his creatures. Remember, you know, we are his people. So it is he that has made us and not we ourselves. So know that we are his people. He is perfectly righteous in his treatment towards his, his creature. God is not partial. He's not partial. So God will not look at you and say, boy, because you have a, a doctorate and you have millions in your bank account, he's going to treat you different from how he's going to treat the next person. God is not partial. The Bible says that he is no respecter of persons. So though God is merciful and long-suffering, God is a just God. He's not partial, right? And in Acts 10, verse 34, then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. So in the partial. And this was when Peter, because Peter now preached the gospel unto the Gentiles. And while he yet spoke, the Bible says, the Holy Ghost fell upon Cornelius and his household. And he, they were baptized. And, God, and Peter said, Look here, God is no respecter of persons because he gave the Jews the Holy Ghost, he gave the Gentiles, the Holy Ghost. Next, um, back to the slide. So God also 
commands against the mistreatment of others in Zechariah 7 verse 10, right? And he perfectly executes vengeance against the oppressors, right? So God is just in meeting out rewards. God is not unjust. He will not forget the good work that you do and the love that you have shown as you have helped his people and continue to help them, right? So God will not forget the good thing that you do. But equally, God is just in meeting out punishment. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for the wrongs that they did. And God will not show any form of favoritism. Let's go to the next slide. So Cain was disrespectful. He was rebellious. He knew what was right. He knew the right thing to do, but he refused to do it. He wanted to serve God, and his one term, he was a murderer. He murdered his brother. But what the Lord did was that the Lord now repaid him, allowed him to do, thought allowed him to do what he wanted to do, and then the Lord repaid him. God is just in meeting out re rewards. He will give you what you deserve. If we continue to go against his will, brethren, he will reward us accordingly. So God is just. And if we do good, God will reward our good. If we do evil, God will reward our evil. Amen. God bless you tonight. Want us to understand, brethren, that, you know, as we look at the dispensation of conscience, you know, it speaks to us. It speaks to me as an individual, you know, and, and it teaches me how to, to recognize, you know, that as an individual, I need to, you know, be true to God. I need to follow you know, I need to do what God requires of me. I need to give God my, myself everything and not give him a part. And, you know, it teaches me about not being rebellious. I want us to understand, Virgin, that God will reward us. Whether we work is good, whether we work is evil, God will reward us accordingly. We Pray that, you know, the word would have done something to you. You would have gained something. You would have been edified. We want to say thank you for tuning in. And, you know, the Lord richly bless you. Father, we thank you for your words tonight. We pray, God, that as the word has gone forth, even right now that you'll be touching lives, you'll be changing lives, you'll be changing the perspective of individuals. God, you will be saving souls. We pray oh god that you will bless your people help us not to do harm to ourselves lord by being rebellious but help us great jesus to come to the point where we can surrender our will to you we pray god your blessing upon everyone that tune in everyone who watches when it premieres everyone that will watch after we pray that your anointing will go forth and that lord it will break yokes let your perfect will be done as we dismiss tonight. Dismiss us with your choicest blessing. Bless one more time, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.